We are uh, in chapter 45 of the book of Psalms, and we are in book 2 or section 2 of the book of Psalms. And like I keep reminding you, if you missed uh, our, the discussion on section 1 or book 1, you go back to our website, fpclakeland.org, and go to the groups and classes tab, and you can watch all the videos way back to even before we started this series on the Psalms uh, called To Consider and Praise. Uh, book two, or at least the beginning of book two, as we've talked about, has been dominated by psalms uh, written under the title of the sons of Korah. And as we pointed out, Korah, as a person, the human being, was a rebellious member of the tribe of Levi. You can look at that uh, story beginning in Numbers chapter 16. We talked about it kind of a little bit here and there. Um, but the sons of Korah, or the Korites, um, were members of the Levite community during the time of the monarchy, and they became especially uh, significant members of the musical tradition of the, the, the period of the monarchy and beyond. Um, if you look at First Chronicles chapter 6, for example, that's really where they, they begin to kind of uh, commission the sons of Korah to make music uh, for the community to the Lord. So far, we've been through Psalm 42 uh, through 44, and we've seen not just Psalms of the sons of Korah, but specifically a word keeps popping up. What's the word? A maskil. This is an interesting word um, that is most closely associated with the Hebrew word for teaching. Uh, but as we kind of have, have looked at the Psalms that are under the heading of Maskil, they're not so much teaching Psalms or, or proverbial Psalms, which is what you might expect with a Maskil, but more meditative Psalms, Psalms that cause you to really think deeply about the, 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 the poem that's in front of you. Um, as we turn to Psalm 45, you're going to notice a big tonal shift from where we have been. Psalm 42, 43, which is actually, how many psalms is Psalm 42, 43? It's actually one psalm in two chapters. Um, if you look at that psalm and then Psalm 44, what has been the overall tone of those psalms? Are they super happy psalms? These are laments. These are lamentations, both individual and and communal. And, and I, I point this out because as we get into Psalm 45, there is definitely a tonal shift. Uh, Psalm 42, 43, that was an individual uh, lament, most likely written during the period of the exile, as the writer is longing for temple worship longing to be back with the people of God, worshiping together, going along in festival and praise. Psalm 44, which is more of a communal lamentation with individual elements, was more likely written during the period of the kings following a defeat. Now, we pointed out last week, uh, what was significant about the defeat that seems to be experienced in light of Psalm 44? What was significant about that defeat? Anybody remember? Sometimes the people of God were defeated, as in the period of the exile, as in the time when they were taken into exile, and that defeat made perfect sense to them, right? Because they had been screw-ups. They had been moral failures. They had, had fallen from the covenant of God. But what's different about Psalm 44 is that they didn't see anything obvious. They didn't see any reason that they were being defeated, except that they were just being defeated. And as we talked about last week, the idea is that even though things don't always make sense in terms of suffering and defeat, God is still in control and has purpose and plans in the middle of it. And uh, their covenant faithfulness was still strong. Now, as we turn the page to Psalm 45... As I said, this is a, a, a turn uh, in tone. But not only is it a turn in tone from where we've been, it's also very unique amongst all of the Psalms. This is an individual Psalm, but it's not a Psalm of lamentation or complaint. It is a Psalm of praise, but not, and this is interesting, not a Psalm of praise addressed to or about God. 
In fact, this is the only psalm that we can clearly identify as a psalm of praise to a human being. In fact, in the entire canon of the Old Testament, this is unique because almost entirely uh, praise from the people of God, the covenant people of God, is reserved rightly for God. And to praise with this kind, as you're going to read, with this kind of verbosity or verbosity uh, to a human being seems almost sacrilegious. But Psalm 45 is addressed to a human being. And additionally, this has a very particular context, which we're going to, um, uh, which uh, which is is very important in uh, the 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 understanding of this psalm, because not only is it a psalm to a human being, it has a very per, uh, a particular circumstance. What is that circumstance? Can anybody tell me? A wedding, a wedding right? How do you know that? Because it says. In the title, what does it say? It says a masculine, right? Sons of Korah, things we've already talked about. Then it says, according to what? Which we have, do we have any idea what that sounds like? No, but it, we obviously know it was a song and there was a tune. This is not the only psalm that talks about lilies, in quotes, as a song tone, but also that it is a wedding song, or in some translations, it says simply, a love song. Isn't that sweet? You just hear the righteous brothers now, right? You just feel that, that moment. Um, so who's writing the song? That's a question. Uh, it's a, the, the, the psalm is written in the first person singular, so it's an individual song of praise, but it's a song of individual praise with a representative voice. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying when I say that? Like the person that's speaking is speaking as an individual I, but is speaking on behalf of the collective we. Does, are you getting, does it make sense? Now, so the question is, who would be talking, and to whom are they talking? So there's two parts of the question. So who's doing the talking, and to whom are they speaking? Um, it's very difficult for us to know with absolute certainty what position the author is taking. Now, if you take the, the title seriously with the Sons of Korah, there's a, there is a religious element to it correct? And obviously, this religious element is, is, is more obvious because it's in the songbook of the Hebrew people for their corporate worship. So there's a good chance that who is talking is possibly a priest or an actual son of Korah, a Korite who is the musical leader of the people, speaking on behalf of the people. And if the occasion is a wedding or a love song, which a wedding is more than likely uh, going to be, uh, or love song is more than likely going to be a wedding song, given the formality of this nature, who would be the object? Okay, well, obviously the groom. Thank you, Marilyn. That was great. Okay, but what position do we feel like the groom has? Why? So, I'm, I'm, you know, I was a groom. How many grooms in here? Anybody? Come on, raise your hand. Now, you need to raise your hands, guys. Some of you have your ladies right next to you, all right? Okay. <laughs> Jeff, did anybody ever write a song of this nature to you? Not to my or about you? No. I, I wish they would. Yeah, it sounds good, right? Me neither. So this person has to have a particular position, and it has to be an important enough position that they would want to actually codify the song. So what figures usually inspire this level of, of musical and poetic um, exuberance? Royalty like a king. And Linda, circle gets the square. There you go. That, that was a, you guys know that? No? Circle gets the square? Tic-tac-toe? No? Just me. I was the only kid that watched that as a kid. That was like a 60s like game show, right? Yeah. Anyway, circle gets the square, Linda. Thank you. Royalty. This is written to the king. Probably 
from a musician in either the royal, it could be a royal court musician, or it could be an actual uh, liturgical musician, as in the sons of Korah. Um, does that mean that the king is being elevated for the king's own sake? We tend to have a, uh, we have a tendency, all of us do, have a tendency to elevate people in power in our minds. We elevate either political figures or sports figures or celebrity figures simply because they hold certain human qualities that we find admirable. But you've got to understand, this is written to the king, more than likely the king, um, and it's the king of, more than likely, the king of Judah, or, we're going to talk about this in a second, the combined people of Israel and Judah. And the king of Israel is not simply a political figure or even a governmental figure. This is very different than any other human authority on the face of the planet that exists today or ever has existed. The king of Israel, the king of Judah, they were literally the political representation of, of God to the people. That was their calling. Look at how David was anointed. Look at even how Saul was anointed, who lost his anointing. Look at how they were anointed. If you go back to the Old Testament, look at how Solomon was anointed. It was not simply, uh, 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 they were not simply committed to upholding the constitution of the people of Israel and Judah, except that their constitution was the law of God. So they were the human ambassadors of God's sovereignty on this planet to the people of God. Now, there are some more modern leaders who, who also try to take that mantle, right? You've ever heard of the divine right of kings? Well, they base their same... They, they base that right on this, 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 this same concept, and it's not... It's, it's not analogous. It's not analogous in the exact same way. The king of Israel, king of Judah, was quite literally God's ambassador, representative king. And that authority that the king has was derived from God. It was not derived from the people. The authority was not derived from the people or their constitution or some social contract theory. It was derived from God. God said, David's my, my guy. And it didn't matter if the people liked it or not. David was the guy. Solomon was the guy. And on and on and on. And so we have this in mind that this is a love song or wedding song written in praise of the king, but in praise of the king because of the king's position and relationship to God and to his bride. There is a political element to this as well. So one of the questions that comes up is, okay, well, which king? Which king is it about? Can we tell with absolute certainty which king this is about. Some people believe that this was addressed to King Ahab at the marriage of Jezebel because of the mention of the people of Tyre. There is a problem with that. Anybody know Ahab and Jezebel's story? High watermark? No, not a high watermark in the life of the people of Israel. Definitely not. In fact, maybe up to the exile, the lowest of the low. So that's unlikely, even though you have that one little mention of the people of Tyre, and that's, there's kind of a tie there. Um, some other commentators, John Calvin, if you read his commentary on this psalm, he, is he has no question who it is. He, he absolutely 100% thinks this is Solomon. He 100% thinks this is Solomon. And there are some internal uh, some internal evidences that point to Solomon. We'll get to, and you'll hear me say this, and that Sol uh, this is specifically uh, regarding his marriage or his union to the Egyptian princess in 1 Kings chapter 3. John Calvin is 100% convinced. If you read Calvin's commentary, he didn't even give you another option. 
Uh, most other uh, commentarians or, or scholars, they're a little bit more up in the air about it. David is an unlikely candidate um, because, uh, not because he didn't marry a lot of women, because um, he did too, um, but, but it would be more likely that this psalm would be attributed as a psalm of David if David was the object. Does did you track with that? Because remember, when you, when you read something that says a psalm of David or a psalm of Korah or a psalm of Asaph, uh, it doesn't mean they wrote it. It could be something that was in their style or about them or you know, something to that, to that uh, nature. Uh, we talked about for a second the idea that this was written according to the lilies, uh, which is a tune name. Just one quick note on that. If you're curious, this same uh, tune was also used, or is also used in Psalm 69 and Psalm 80. Um, part of this being a love song makes this psalm less less comparable to other psalms and more comparable to the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, which is another reason John Calvin thought this was actually about Solomon. Uh, I know everybody in this room loves reading the Song of Songs. I know because when we started the community Bible reading plan at the beginning of this year, what was the very first book that you had to read at the beginning of 2021? Song, Song of Songs. Really started off the year right, I think, you know? And I, I know I heard from some people like, Oh my gosh, I can't wait till I get through this. Why, why do we feel like that? Because what is the Song of Songs about? Love. It's about love. It's about, it, 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 uses, it uses the imagery of marriage love to communicate something about the love that God has for his people and the people have for, his, for God. And we get super uncomfortable about that. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. Okay? Uh, even though thematically there is a lot to compare with the Song of Psalms, linguistically, grammatically, and structurally, there are almost no parallels in the Song of Songs. Okay, so let's get into verse, uh, the, this actual psalm itself. Verse 1 gives us the thematic introduction. The writer writes this, My heart overflows with a pleasing theme. I address my verses to the king. Now, automatically, you should have known who this was to because he says it right there at the beginning. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. I want to stop there for just a second because this is a thematic introduction. The, the author is actually telling you exactly what he's writing about, exactly what he's doing. He, he, this is a direct statement. And it, and it also gives you the depth of what he's writing about. He says, my heart overflows. This is coming from the very depths of this person's soul. And he's, he's thinking and he's meditating in his heart on what he calls a noble or pleasing or good theme. Now, as I said at the beginning, the, the author could be either a court troubadour or uh, a uh, a, a musical leader from the temple, because as go the people of as go the king, so go the people of God. Now, if it was uh, one of those two, uh, either a, a court poet or a co court troubadour, like we would think in the Middle Ages, or if it was a a, uh, uh, a musical leader from the temple, there's a good chance that this was not first composed as a written poem, but it's likely that it was actually a extemporaneously written or extemporaneously sung song in joy for the king and his union to his new bride. So that the, 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 the person is actually improvising this by the Spirit of God into this moment. Now, that doesn't mean it wasn't edited later and codified later and, 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 and kind of formed more significantly to be included in the psalmody, but it was uh, part of the celebration of the king's wedding, and, and it was later kind of codified and formalized and put in the book of Psalms and would have been used at other royal weddings. 
at other royal weddings so that this, this same theme would, would generate through all the kings uh, of Israel and Judah's and their, their uh, marriages. He, he's, the writer is so enthusiastic over the royal wedding that it, 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 it's almost odd to us. But it's not because of the significance of the individual about whom he's writing. It's about the significance of the event. Because it was... Now, this should not surprise us at all. Royal weddings, even in America, when we have no royalty, are kind of a big deal. Now, I'm going to ask a very probing question. How many people watched Princess Diana and Charles... Come on, raise your hands high, be proud. Oh, see, look at that. Now, you know she's not our princess. She, she wasn't our princess, right? <laughs> Charles, not our prince, but still did it. Anybody watch the more recent ones that they've had? Uh, we did, very early in the morning. I watched William and Kate. I was up at the crack of dawn watching that, watching the whole thing. Even Meghan and Harry, I watched that whole thing. I, didn't, I don't watch the other ones like Eugenie and stuff like that. But um, I, the fact that I know her name should impress you though. <laughs> but it speaks to the idea that the event for whatever reason is significant to us. Now it could be different reasons, but the event here is significant for what it implies about what God is doing in the life of the king and in the life of his people. And so the author begins to talk about the king. And he starts with praising not just, not just the attributes of the king in general, but he starts by praising what sort of attributes. Let's read this. Let me read this to you. Aren't you glad I'm not making you read this out loud? It does make me a bit uncomfortable. Um, the author writes, you are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. When the author begins, what attributes does he specifically praise at the outset? You're mighty handsome. It's physical. There's a physical appearance that the author is kind of praising. Now, we look at this and sometimes we get a little surprised. Now, why are we surprised by this? Because what does God specifically say? Does he judge by appearances? No. In, in, in 1 Samuel... 16, God specifically tells Samuel, when Samuel is going to look for the next king of Israel, after the, the, the kind of the falling down of Saul, he goes to uh, the sons of Jesse, and, and Samuel is sure it's all the other sons, right? Because they're all big and they're strapping. And what does God say to him? First Samuel 16, verse 7, he says, do not look at outward appearance. God does not judge by appearances. But here's the crazy part. If you look at 1 Samuel 16, and you look at then at verse 7, and then go five verses later, do you know what it says about David? He's handsome. It actually says he's handsome and, and ruddy in appearance. I don't know what ruddy is, but, and no one's ever called me ruddy before, but it's apparently a compliment. He immediately says he doesn't judge by appearances, and then five verses later, he praises his appearance. It's not that God looks at someone who's attractive and says, obviously they're good for leadership. But for the people who judge by appearances, that does make a difference apparently to some extent. And we know it does. In leadership, it just does. I'm not saying it's the right or wrong thing. I'm just saying what it is. And so it shouldn't really surprise us that this is how it opens. But that's not where it ends, right? Because what's the very next statement 
that the writer praises? What's, what's the very next thing that he praises? He praises the leader, the king's uh, uh, ability to speak. But it's not just any old ability to speak. How, what's the word that he uses? He uses the word grace. Now, the word grace is really significant because that is a word that is a reflection of the attributes of God. It's a reflection of the attribute of uh, an attribute of God. It's not just he speaks eloquently. He speaks with the voice of God. Now, does that mean he's God-like and they're deifying the king? No, 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 no. It means that he's actually standing in such a relationship with, with God, that the king is in such a relationship with God that his very words reflect attributes of God. And therefore, he can say, God has blessed you for ever. He's not simply a good orator, but he reflects the character of God himself. The king is not only handsome to look at and a great speaker, but he's also given military victory. He says, gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. Again, those words, splendor and majesty. Whoops, I'm going to get that right. Splendor and majesty. Those are also words that are typically reserved for who? For God. So we have grace, we have splendor, and we have majesty. These are, these are attributes that are applied ordinarily to the Lord, but because of the king's relationship with the Lord, are now can and can be applied to the king. This is a very important point as you read verse 3 and verse 4. He says in, in verse 4, In your majesty write out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and rightness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. Um, the, the whole idea here is that the king, when he's going out and riding victoriously, he's not just riding for his own uh, power to be advanced. He's riding out into battle for the cause of God. For the cause, look at the, look, look at the cause, the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Literally, the king is fighting those which are an oppression. In the, in the Hebrew, it's, it's an oppression to righteousness. This is a, a high concern of God, those who are oppressed. Um, if you went through the first section of, Psalm, uh, of the book of Psalms and you watch those videos uh, during our lockdown period, you know that God is very concerned about those who are on the margins, the fatherless, the widows, the sojourner. You look at Psalm chapter 9, verse 12, Psalm chapter 10, verse 2, Psalm chapter 14, verse 6, amongst many, many others. God's concern is for those who are oppressed. And the king, as God's representative ambassador on the earth, he's the one that God is called to take up the sword for the cause of God on the earth to fight that oppression. And so when the author is elevating the splendor and the majesty of the king. It's not just for the, ma the, the king's own sake and his own ego. It's for the sake of the cause of God. And so the king who already exhibits qualities and the priorities of the king, he's called to continually reflect on the awesome. See, it says in, that ver in, verse, um, in verse 5, let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Actually, in the Hebrew, that word awesome can mean the dread deeds of God. The dread deeds of God that come down hard on those who oppress others. And even though the king is already fighting the oppression in the splendor and the majesty of God, he still has more yet to learn. So the author is saying, continue 
to learn, continue to be taught by the awesome, the dread deeds of God. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, the people's fall under you. The, the victory is guaranteed because it's a victory on behalf of God. Now, I will say this is one of those moments when you read it, and you go kind of fast over verse 5. Um, you don't realize how, how graphic it actually is. Your arrows are sharp in the hearts of the king's enemies. This, this graphically depicted victory demonstrates that the enemies of the king are the enemies of God. And the enemies of God are the enemies of the king. This is one of the themes that you see in the, in the, in the, in the royal psalms in, in, in book one, is that the, there's, an, there's an equating of the, the, the enemies of the king and the enemies of God because the king is in, if the king is in a right relationship with God, they are the same. So when we read like Psalm chapter two, and you read about this, this, this royal kind of conflict with the nations. The king, as God's representative, is in that conflict, but God is also in that conflict. In fact, God is in the conflict with the king, and the king, on behalf of God, is, is, is his agent in this conflict. And so he's praised, the king is praised for his handsomeness, his ability to speak with the grace of God and his ability to act on behalf of God against the oppression of righteousness, truth, and meekness. And so the result is that the king has great and awesome benefits. The focus then shifts in verse 6. This is what it says. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory places, stringed in instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. The, the focus of verse 6 is on the parallel between the earthly king and the Lord king, whom he represents. Now, it's difficult for commentators to really wrap their brains around what verse 6 means. Now, I'm just going to ask, does anyone have a, a slightly different translation? Because there are a couple of translations that are different. Most of them kind of follow that translation, um, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. But it, there could be another translation based on how you interpret the Hebrew. Because if you read it like I just read it, it seems like the author is shifting his praise focus from the king to God. And, and, and it could very well be that's what's happening. For one half of a verse, the, the author is shifting focus to God. That's the typical kind of reading. That's how you kind of typically read it. But given the preceding verses and then the remaining verses, which clearly address a human king and the human princess, we're going to get that in a moment, does it really make sense that the poet is shifting uh, attention? He might be to draw a very specific uh, focus on this moment, or as some people have read it, and this is a little bit deeper cut, is he referring to the king as God, which would ease the poetic flow, but it would kind of create some theological issues. Some have thought that the verse should be rendered as your throne is like God's. It's everlasting. Others have proposed a reading that goes like this. Your divine throne is forever and ever. That's the old RSV. If you have an old RSV, which they, they changed that reading in the, in the new one. Um, the old RSV read it like that. Your divine throne is forever and ever. Or your throne is God's forever and ever. Um, there is one translation that reads like that. The problem is that none of those alternatives fit grammatically or within the syntax. The best explanation 
is that the author does have the king in view, but the throne, no matter who sits on it in this earthly realm, the throne is still God's. It's God's throne by virtue of the fact um, that the authority and the strength, which is represented by the king's scepter later in that verse, is based not on his own political prowess or his governmental leadership. It's based on God's righteousness and his, his uh, truth. And so the authority of the king is a, I say this again, it's a derived authority so that the king's throne is God's throne. It's God's throne. It's not King David's throne. It's not Solomon's throne. It's not, you know, fill in the blank of all the kings. It's God's throne ultimately. And that throne is forever and ever, no matter who is sitting on it. Now, from another sense, and this really throws a fly in the ointment, from another sense, there are times in biblical history when a representative of God is firmly identified as God to a particular group of people or person. Does anyone know when that happens? Most prime example? Not Jesus, by the way, that's too easy. There's, there's a, there's, there are always two answers in Sunday school class. One is Jesus, but we're talking about the Old Testament. Who is it? Oh, come on. Moses! Moses! In uh, Exodus uh, verse, uh, or chapter 14, or chapter 4, sorry. Exodus 4. I'm going to write it down so you can look it up later and check me out. Um, Moses is talking, or God is talking to Moses about Aaron, okay? Because remember, God called Moses to go to Pharaoh. And what did Moses say? No, I'm not doing it. Why? I can't talk good, which is probably exactly what he said because he can't talk good. Um, and so God, God, in his grace, although God has a little attitude with Moses about the whole thing, uh, rightly so, God allows Moses to bring his brother Aaron. And this is what he says in Exodus 4, verse 16. He says, uh, God says to Moses, he, Aaron, shall speak for you to the people and he shall be your mouth and you shall be as God to him. Now, what does he mean there? He means as Moses is to God, a prophet of God, Aaron will be the prophet of Moses speaking the words of God through Moses to, the, to Pharaoh and to the people. So he actually uses the term, you will be as God to Aaron. Now, if you think that's the only time it happens, it's not. In Exodus, also with uh, referring to Moses, uh, Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh and your brother shall be your prophet. So if you take those lenses, it's not as big a stretch to say, to look at how the, the psalmist is referring to the throne of the king as the throne of God. Um, this doesn't mean we should reflect kind of an ancient Near Eastern sort of interpretation where the king is God and should be worshipped as God, but rather it, it, it indicates the intimacy of the leader of God's people, in, this case, in, in, in the case of Exodus, Moses, in the case of even David and Solomon, the king, with God. Thus, the psalmist writes that God has anointed his king with an oil of gladness and joy. If you look at verse 7, that, that image of anointing is very, very significant on two different levels. There are two times, well, there are multiple times, but there will be two times that a king would be anointed. And the first is at his anointing as the king. The second time would be, anybody know? At his death, but... Let's think about, yes, true, but think about before that in a more happy moment. At his wedding. He's anointed at his wedding. So you get this, this double image, and at his death, there's, there are bigger theological uh, kind of ramifications with that. But in this case, you have the anointing of both his kingship, 
which like in the case of David, and then, and then later on, you would have the, the, the priest or the prophet of God actually anointing the king on behalf of God. And then as the king is getting married, you would have this moment of anointing with gladness and joy. The therefore, in verse 7, ties the accomplishments of this king, the attributes of praise, to this moment. And so this joy is then experienced by those around in a very uh, physical way. He begins to talk about the fragrancy of the anointing oils, the myrrh and the aloes and the cassia and the companions around, the people around, the the harpists, the the people who, who play the lyre, the stringed instruments. And so the daughters of kings, the princesses are around as ladies of honor. And there begins to be a shift slightly in focus in this section from the king as an individual to the king with his new queen. Notice at the end of verse 9, it says, At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. Now, this is one of the I said earlier um, that John Calvin just wholeheartedly believed this is about Solomon. And, uh, and this is one of the, the internal indications that it might be Solomon. Um, the gold of Ophir was mentioned uh, several times in the Bible in the period of the kings. Um, in 1 Kings chapters 9 and 10 and in uh, chapter 22... Um, it was listed, and these are what we would con- consider, some people consider, the, 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 the gold mines of King Solomon, this, this place of Ophir. Now, this is, where is this located? Because I know some of you are like, where is this located? They didn't know, they didn't have a really good take on where it was located for a very long time, but several years ago, they uncovered some gold mines, which they believe were the, the mines of Ophir in west central Saudi Arabia. So you think of Saudi Arabia, um, I'm not going to draw it, that would be just really bad. Um, but you think of the, you guys can picture Saudi Arabia, the peninsula in your mind. Think of the western part in the center, and which right underneath that, that's right underneath basically where Israel and Judah were. So this is the, the gold of Ophir. More than likely, they're referring to the mines of Solomon, which is why one of, one of the reasons John Calvin believes this is about Solomon. Uh, and that's, is that, is that 100% that Ophir was located in west central Saudi Arabia? No. But it does does have a a high likelihood. So we get this shift of focus at the end of verse 9 to the queen who stands in gold of Ophir. And so the author begins to talk to and about this, this new daughter of Israel. He says, Hear, O daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. Since he is your lord, bow to him. The people of Tyre will seek your favor with gifts, the richest of the people. All glorious is the princess in her chamber with robes interwoven with gold. In many colored robes, she is led to the king with her virgin companions following behind her. With joy and gladness, they are led along as they enter the palace of the king. So with the, the, the shift in focus, the notion here is that the bride must also be honored as, as honored Because the king, remember God's representative on this earth, has favored this woman to be his own. She she has, has had to leave her former life. She's had to leave her former household and all the familiarity of that household. So she can have this position at the king's side. But that position will be to her ultimate benefit. If you look at how how uh, the benefits are described. She will be honored. People will, will cherish her opinion and will cherish her presence. They will seek her favor. And so she owes to the king everything as the king owes everything to God. Um, and so she bows to him. Now, 
we're pretty uncomfortable with this kind of notion today, and I get that. But it's important to remember that this submission that was called for in Psalm 45, it's not about an uh, abusive demand of respect by the king, but it was an earned respect that he had because of the king's godly attributes. He loves righteousness. He hates wickedness. He actively promotes the righteousness and the meekness and the truth of God while actively destroying those who are wicked and liars. He's earned this position because it's been given to him by God. So there's this, this relationship between his God and this new bride. People will elevate her, seeking her favor, showering her with gifts. The people of Tyre, this is a reference to a stronghold city on the Mediterranean coast. Uh, Tyre, the people of Tyre are mentioned quite frequently during the period of the kings. King Hiram of Tyre uh, was called upon by King David to bring uh, cedar wood for the building of David's own palace. And King Hiram later sent all sorts of wood and, and workers of, of wood uh, to Solomon for the building of the temple. The gifts that the people would give from, from the city of Tyre to the queen then would have been significant. And the idea is kind of the building of the household. These are household building kinds of people. They're, they're very wealthy, but they're also very practical in their gift giving. Uh, this is... is Another kind of a reason that John Calvin likely would have attributed um, this to uh, King Solomon because of the mention of King or the people of Tyre. The queen remains in focus throughout these six verses. And again, in a parallel fashion to how we look at the king earlier, it shifts not to her attributes, but to what she wears, to how she moves and the companions that uh, surround her. So you, you have this kind of parallelism between the king and then the queen. As the psalm closes, the shift goes back to the king. The focus goes back to the king. In place of your fathers shall be your sons. You will make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. The processional of the wedding is complete. And there's a promise of the future glory of the king and of the nation. It was very, very important, especially in ancient Near Eastern cultures and, all, and actually cultures all the way up to the modern day, in, in, especially in monarch societies, about the, this idea of uh, the royal lineage. What, what were the progeny going to be? The offspring. And so the promise of future glory is found in the children of the king and queen. And that, that offspring, that legacy is promised to be great. And it will spread their authority to the ends of the earth. Notice that language, in all the earth. Now this is, again, this is a derivative authority. This is not an authority like, you know, Alexander the Great or one of the Roman Caesars. This is given by God. And the legacy will be secured and remembered by nations, praised by nations forever and ever. Again, there's, this, there's a linguistic connection here to verse 6 with the throne of God. One of the questions that comes up when reading verses 16 and 17, is who is speaking in verse 17? Verse 17, I will cause your name to be remembered. Now, there are two options, really. The first option is the author is speaking. The author is saying, by virtue of this poem, he's going to make the name of the king great and remembered uh, in all generations. Therefore, you will have praise forever and ever. That the, by virtue of this one psalm, the, the author believes it will endure, and so he will be praised forever and ever. The other option is what? This is where you answer God. The other option is that God is speaking to the king, and therefore it's God's intervention in the king's life which will 
ensure his enduring legacy. Now, the best option, I think, is that it is a hybrid because the author is speaking on behalf of God, He's th- that, which happens quite often in the Psalms. We read this quite often in the Psalms. He's acting in the role of almost a prophet, speaking the words of God on behalf of God to the people of God, because who alone can establish this permanent legacy? Only God. This this, this poem might have been written down on a piece of paper that was crumpled up and burned in the fire and would never have been remembered again. Only God could even in, keep, make, make sure that the piece of paper that it was originally written on endured beyond the time of its writing. Only God can do that. And so, it's not overstated that the sovereignty of God establishes the legacy of the enduring sovereignty of the king. Now, it should be obvious to us that this easily applies to Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who is both human and divine. And the thing is, as the monarchy in Judah collapsed, and as the monarchy in Israel collapsed following the exile, the people of God in Israel and Judah, they they began to look at Psalm 45 with messianic eyes. How could this be true if the the king is no more, if there are no more kings? And yet they also knew that God had made a covenant promise to David that the line of David would sit on the throne of of his people forever. So they applied this to the future Messiah. And for those of us living on the other side of the Messiah, we can see very plainly how this applies to Jesus Christ. Jesus came to inaugurate a renewed kingdom of God that is not bound by any kind of borders or ethnic superiority because Jesus' kingdom reaches to where? The nations forever and ever, all the earth. All right there in verse 17. The attributes of the king in Psalm 45, they only can be fully applied to the perfect Jesus. Jesus is the only human king that can also be rightly addressed as God. There's no metaphorical sense when we call Jesus God. It's literal. It's actual. Jesus is God. He is the sovereign Lord. As Paul writes in in, in, in Philippians chapter 2, at the name of Jesus, rightly, what will happen? Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The victory that Jesus has over sin and death is total. He's the one that rides out with the sword against the oppression of righteousness and truth and meekness and accomplishes that which was only prefigured in the Old Testament kingdom. At the same exact time, Jesus has a bride. Not in some sort of Da Vinci Code sort of way, but in the way of the church. The image of God's people as a bride stretches back to the Old Covenant. We talked about the Song of Psalms, Song of Songs, but also in the prophecy of Hosea. The prophecy of, of Hosea. Hosea actually lived the life of. Uh, that was represent, uh, a representation of God with his people. And, and, and idolatry throughout the Old Covenant is presented as a, a marriage unfaithfulness, as an infidelity. Jesus himself uses the image of, uh, 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 of, of a, a wedding in Matthew 22. In that parable... He talks about a wedding feast. And it's worth mentioning that that parable is also not just a wedding feast, but it's a royal wedding feast. So it makes sense that Paul would take up the same image of God and his people in in this metaphorical kind of uh, fashion of of wedding uh, and marriage in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 and following. The image there is that the church, as the bride of Christ, much the same as the bride in Psalm 45, submits to the Lord, and the Lord beautifully adorning his bride, the church, with splendors of gifts and making her 
holy. The church has honor only by virtue of its submission to the Lord. Now, there are times when we get kind of uncomfortable with that image. With all the, because like, here's the thing, when, when God uses a metaphor in scripture, we got to really unpack it with all that it means. And when we really start to unpack the metaphor of, of the bride of Christ as being the church and Christ being the king, it gets to be a little uncomfortable for us today. Why? Because we don't really like to talk about the privacy of marriage in public s- settings. These are private matters which should not be aired whether it's the financial or emotional or physical aspects of a marriage, there are things that we think we just ought not think about when it comes to other people and other relationships. This is an issue focused more on our tribe, the Reformed people, than it is with others, um, though this sometimes plagues non-Reformed folks as well. We tend to think of, we, we tend to equate faith and our relationship with Jesus as more of an intellectual function. And marriage is not just an intellectual function. If you approach marriage just intellectually, guess what? You're not going to be married very long. There's an emotional, passionate connection between spouses. And that emotional, passionate connection is what is also imagined in this, this, this comparison between the church as the bride of Christ and Jesus as the royal king groom. We, and I'm in this boat, trust me, we like it to be just up here instead of here and here in the gut. Yet unless we're willing to submit our hearts, our souls, our strength, and our minds, something that should be interpreted in a very physical way with all of its ramifications, unless we submit there, we do not really truly understand the beauty and the glory of what it means to be God's people, the bride of Christ. Until we get that, we don't fully get it. And the language is intimate for a reason. Because God desires that we open ourselves up entirely to the Lord as husband and wife do with one another. Jesus has not withheld himself from us, but gives his all for our sake. And we're part of the church, the bride of Christ. We're part of that. Let's pray. Lord God, we ask your forgiveness when we withhold ourselves from you. You've called us your bride. What a beautiful image that you would love us so much, that would, you would give your very body, sacrificing it on the cross for our sakes. Lord, forgive us when we only want to kind of give you our mind and a little bit of our emotion. Help us, Lord. Enable us by your Spirit to be more and more open to you and better understand what it means to be your bride. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.